I might touch on a few unpopular opinions in this video, but Schofield never fails to impress me, even when he's just jamming a well-known jazz standard. And it is surprising how traditional his approach is, while he still manages to really add his own sound to the whole thing. Isn't that what it's really all about? One of the beautiful things about jazz is that you don't only play your own music, you also interpret jazz standards that make up a big part of the repertoire. And it's always super interesting to hear how people you admire interpret songs feels a little bit like you're playing with them at a jam session. The video that I'm talking about here also gives me the chance to be a bit patriotic, since Schofield is playing with the Danish-Vietnamese bass player Chris Mendoki, and it appears to be a recording for Danish TV. The song is Alone Together, certainly one of the most common jam session standards in the book, and let's start with how he plays the theme, because that already may be sort of an unpopular opinion. And later I'm also going to talk about why I think Schofield is probably one of the first jazz guitarists to be really important for the entire style, which might be another hot take. So grab your pitchforks and check this out. Since they're playing in a duo, then Schofield is adding chords to the melody, but the way he does it is really effective and probably also my preferred approach, mainly because it gives you room to really phrase the melody and let that shine. A great example of the other approach would be something like Do Pass on uh, Aiden Misbehaven. Now, of course, here Joe Pass is also playing solo guitar, so he needs to cover more of the groove as well. And actually, I also think that the instrument and the sound matters a bit here. The melody of Alone Together lends itself really well to this because the structure is often a pickup and then a long note on beat one, which gives you a lot of room to add chords, like he does in this section. First, you get the melody just adding the fifth under that first D note. And then under the sustained A, he's sort of adding in this E half diminished with a ninth. Going to A7, which he resolves by just sliding the C sharp up to D. And then you get the melody again. And then on the A half diminished, D7, he's just spilling out the D7 under that sustained A again, so. And then you get this really nice three-part harmonization of the melody on the G minor. Sort of starting out with what is almost like a G minor seven of two voicing, but really he's only playing the three notes here and then moving into this where you have this as a G minor shell voicing and this is just a chromatic approach for the A. So, And then up here you get another shell voicing, which is just a B flat major seven shell voicing, but that then serving as sort of a G minor nine sound in the context. Another thing that stands out to me is how Schofield often adds voice movement with suspensions under the major 7 chord. First, some octaves and then a nice major 7 sharp 5 that resolves. You also want to notice that he very often plays E7 to A7 instead of uh, E half diminished to A7, like this. And that is of course a small detail to add in there, but he really uses it incredibly well in the solo too, which really gives it some personality and changes the overall sound. I always found this so impressive, even if it is subtle, but Schofield is able to do so much with the sound, picking some notes close to the bridge to get a different sound using pick and fingers or just fingers for some parts. And he changes this very often, but still manages the whole thing to sound like a coherent thing. It doesn't change the sound in a way that doesn't fit with the music. Check out how he's really using where he picks the strings to get a different sound. There are two things that you want to learn from this. First, notice that in the first bar, he really picks with sort of a more of a mellow sound, so. And then for the second bar, he moves down closer to the bridge to get sort of a more nasal, more nasty sound. The second thing connects to how I talked about some more traditional aspects of his playing. And here is one of them. He's not playing E half diminished to A7 in that line. It's all A7 altered, like Joe Pass or Barry Harris. 
he doesn't play the two chord all the time. This really connects to how he starts the solo as well. I think it was in one of the concerts that I've seen where he was playing with Bill Stewart and Steve Swallow, where he talked about how he loved to practice bebop tunes and check out Charlie Parker. So it really isn't a surprise to me that he knows that part of it as well, even if I didn't recognize that in the first things that I heard from him, which had a lot of New Orleans and blues influence. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Let's first listen to the first part of the solo. So he's really just playing arpeggios as a pickup into the solo. First on the E half diminished, he's playing the triad from the third of the chord. So for E half diminished, that's a G minor triad. And then the triad from the third of the next chord. And that's of course A7, so that's a C sharp diminished triad. And then neatly resolving this to F on B1 at the top of the chorus for the, for the solo. The next phrase he plays also shows that he doesn't only rely on eighth note lines and bebop lines, but also has a wide vocabulary of rhythms as well. So he skips up to the E on the D minor chord. And then here he starts this rhythmical pattern, which is sort of a group of three eight notes. So, and then resolving that when he gets to D minor again. So, just playing a D minor triad. The next part really lets the E7 shine. So, you clearly have the E7 in there because you have a B sharp and a G sharp which is definitely not E half diminished at least. And then you get some counter movement in the melody. And so there are two voices moving here. The lower voice is going from G sharp, G to F, so moving down, and then the higher voice moves the other way. So that moves from B to C sharp to D. And that gives you this, which is a very nice sound. There's another really great example of this later in the solo. I'll get to that. Now again, he's not playing the two chord uh, on the A half diminished D seven, he goes straight to the D7, so. And you can of course hear that because there's no A half diminished when he's playing the F sharp right on beat one as he does here. This is super typical for Schofield, but also really one of the things that I love about his playing, harmony and melody just melting together. The first part is a chromatic run, which I suspect is actually a Parker lick, but it's kind of hard to tell. And here he's using a lot of legato, which of course is also a very typical part of John Schofield's sound and phrasing. Now, if I try to do that just with up and down picking and try and do it fast, it comes a yick. You know, I can't get nothing happening. It sounds like really bad, but I can go. Then you hear the E half diminished to A7, which is really just a scale run, so. but of course still just nailing the changes and spelling out the harmony. But the part that I really like here is the resolution to the third interval and then adding the melody over the sustained F sharp. And here he's starting with an open string and he actually did something very similar to that in the theme with an open E. This is such a beautiful sound and again a way of making the best possible use of what is practical on the instrument. From there you hear a short Lydian major seven lick maybe even like a Lydian augmented sound, or you can sort of consider this to be the flat nine of an A7, and then he continues to the next A part. Few guitarists have had as big an impact on jazz as John Schofield, having worked with everyone from Miles Davis to Joe Henderson, Michael Brecker to Chris Potter. His music and take on jazz guitar is a huge influence, maybe more on jazz in general than on jazz guitar as sort of a sub genre, which also just tells you how fantastic a musician he is. My introduction to jazz was actually discovering Schofield and Charlie Parker at the same time, both being really strong and playing the blues. That was probably what I sort of could hang on to and what I could recognize and relate to and what made me like jazz so much. As jazz guitarists, then we often live in a bubble where we focus most on the guitar players in the style. But in most of jazz history, then guitar players were not what shaped the sound of the style. Mostly, this was left to horn players like Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, or piano players like Bill Evans and Herbie Hancock. Now, before the comment section explodes in outrage, <gasps> let me just explain what I mean. Kenny Burrell or even Wes or Joe Pass did not really start a new direction in jazz. It wasn't so that all the musicians that were not guitar players bought their albums, so there are no 
kind of blue or giant steps albums coming from these guys that doesn't really make them lesser musicians so keep in mind that this is not a criticism of their playing or ability in any way i'm just looking at it a bit beyond what albums that were game-changing for jazz guitarists and widening the scope to jazz in general. I think that Schofield and probably also Metheny did have that type of genre-defining impact on jazz as a style. Right. When I was studying, then everyone had Schofield quartet albums, especially meant to be, because they were sort of the working, steaming and relaxing albums of that period. You hear it pop up in other albums where the connection back to those albums is super clear. And I think that was the first time that the influence of a guitarist really went across the entire style and didn't stay with guitar players. For Schofield, it was probably a lot about groove and pulling in new influences to jazz, especially New Orleans grooves and also some more acoustic sounding funk groove. I think it is worthwhile giving Schofield that credit and it is really nice to be able to reference his music when talking to other musicians on gigs if you want to play a song in a Ponciana or a second line groove. Now that the guitar became a more genre defining instrument in jazz so late probably also has to do with the instrument evolving and being very dominant in pop and rock music. But of course this may be a hot take. What do you think? There's a comment section. Check out these funky counterpoint ideas. This is really great. Again, more open rhythmical phrases and not bebop lines, but he's using the E7 and getting into it using this really nice six interval idea. It's almost like a minor two five in A minor. Now the real counterpoint is the next phrase, which is sort of Bach meets blues. Only a few notes that are moving as counterpoint. So you have the G going down to F on top of the whole thing and then B and C moving the other way. And then he goes into another variation of the E7, A7 that he's used earlier, so. But also still just a really nice touch to have that in there. I really think that the way Schofield uses intervals and sparse voicings to make the individual voices more clear is really effective. And it's a great way to get the melody across, both in solos and when you're playing called melody. Developing this in your playing can really open up for some beautiful sounds and add a complete other dimension to your playing. If you want to explore that further, then a contemporary of Schofield, Bill Frisell, is who you should check out. And I go over how his take on Days of Wine and Roses works, which is actually incredibly beautiful, in this video. Check it out.